Father God, we thank you because you are our Ebenezer. You are our Ebenezer. When we try everything else and it doesn't work. <laughs> In fact, really, we shouldn't be trying anything else. We should just come straight to you because we know you are our Ebenezer. <laughs> when we are down, you are the one that leads us up. When we call, you answer us. By stone of help, you know, only you are our helper. When I call, you answer. You answer us. When we are down, you lift us up. Our stone of help, only you are our helper. We bless your name. Father God, as your words come this morning, I pray we mingle with faith in our hearts. Daddy, you said the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. What we want is a spirit of the word today. We don't just want letter. We want the spirit, the rhema of the word. So God, we will leave this place charged. We will leave this place full. We will leave this place equipped. We will leave this place transformed in the name of Jesus. To so take on the world for Jesus. In Sunday school today, we were learning about Christian apologetics. Father, by virtue of this word today, you will embolden us. You will empower us to engage in Christian apologetics. We will no longer be afraid or worried about sharing our faith. We'll be able to contend for the faith, defend the faith in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, enrich us with your words. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen, amen and amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank God for who he is. Today's topic is Rock of Ages, Clept for Me. How many people know that hymn? Rock of Ages, Clept for Me. It's a hymn that we sang over and over in school. In fact, a lot of the hymns I know today, I learned them in assembly in school. I don't know what they do in assemblies in schools now, but in assemblies in those days, we sing hymns. That's where I learned all the hymns. And you learn it by heart, because sometimes you don't have a book. So all the verses, you have learned them. Praise God. God will help us to return back to the good, good old days of hymns. And we're going to start introducing hymns gradually in church. We'll be doing more of hymns as well, because hymns are really meaningful. Um, let's read Isaiah 26, verse 4. Isaiah 26, verse 4. I'm going to read three versions because I want to pick out specific things. So I'll start with the Amplified Version. And it says, Trust confidently in the Lord forever. He is your fortress, your shield, your banner. For the Lord God is an everlasting rock. And in brackets, it puts the rock of ages. He is the everlasting rock. He is the rock of ages. In the KJV version, it reads, Isaiah 26, 4 as well, still, it says, Trust ye in the Lord forever, for the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. So he is everlasting strength, and we put our trust in him. The New Living Translation says, Trust in the Lord always, for he is the eternal rock. The God I'm introducing to us today, and talking about today, is not a God for a season. Is a God everlastingly. Is a God eternally. Is a God forever. So if you look at a physical rock, a physical rock is enduring. If a rock had been placed there by God, it would still be there. Generations will come, generations will go, the rock will stand firm. It will stand solid. So it's fitting that when we are describing God, we describe him as a rock. Because God is everlasting. He's the everlasting rock. He's the eternal rock. He's the everlasting strength. He's our eternal refuge. He's an unfailing source of strength. He's an unfailing source of strength. He's immovable. He's constant. That is important for us to note that. God is steady and God is unchanging. He's the unchanging rock and he's the rock of ages. So rock of ages simply means he's steadfast, he's true, he's unmoving, he's unyielding. And like Hebrews 13, 8 tells us, he's unchanging. He's the same God yesterday, today, and for how long? Forever. Forever. That was why that song, you say, Ebenezer, our stone of help. Only you are our helper. That stone does not change. He remains the same. 
So my appeal to us is, let that be your focus. Let that be your, it's so easy these days to fix our gaze elsewhere. But I'm introducing you to the rock of ages, the everlasting rock, our eternal refuge, the one who is constant and unchanging. The psalmist says in Psalm 18 verse 2, the Lord is my rock. Whose rock is he? Uh, say it confidently, church. My rock. rock. He's my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. He is my rock. Praise God. Deuteronomy 32, 4 says, He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. A God of truth, without iniquity, just and right he is. He is the rock. There is no replacement for God. So that's my appeal to you. Every time you are passing through a challenge, every day, every moment, fix your gaze on the rock of ages. He is the rock. There's no, there's no replica of God. If you see a replica of God from anywhere, they just sold you a lie. And I hope you didn't pay for it. Because there is no replica for God. I know there are a lot of people who are trying to put themselves in the place of God. There can be no replica for God. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Psalm 18, 31 and 46. Psalm 18, 31 and 46 says, For who is God? Save the Lord. Or who is a rock? Except our God. The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock. And let the God of my salvation be exalted. He's the God of our salvation. He's the rock of our salvation. As it says also in Psalm 95, verse 1. It says, Oh, come, let us sing. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. The one who has saved us is a rock who cannot be moved. The price he paid was huge. He's the rock. Um, praise the name of the Lord. So all these scriptures refers to God's ability to save, his powerful ability to save us. You know, we haven't been saved by somebody who is weak and feeble, that the enemy can come and snatch us from his hand. No. You know what the Bible says? It says, as many as, you know, Jesus Christ said, as many as the Father have given to me. He says, nobody can pluck them out of my hand. Isn't that what he said? He said, nobody can pluck them. No devil, no demon can pluck them, can pluck us out of his hand. He's the all-powerful rock of salvation. Praise the name of the Lord. So our theme for this month, like you all know, is in Christ alone. In Christ. So how do we enter into Christ? Because it says in Christ alone. So okay, assuming we want to enter into Christ, how is that going to happen? So the hymn writer, um, Rock of Ages, says, Clept for me, let me hide myself in thee. Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Rock of Ages, what does that mean? What is the meaning of the word cleft? Cleft means to split apart. Unless Christ allowed himself to be split apart, none of us could enter into him. But that songwriter was very correct. He says, Rock of Ages, cleft, split apart for me. Christ was cleft for us so we can gain entry into him. In fact, the Bible says he was split from the Father so he can force through the way of salvation for us through sin. Sin is very dark, but thank God Jesus Christ was cleft for us. He was separated for us so that we can gain access. A cleft in a rock is a narrow opening. So what did Jesus do? He made a hiding place for us in him, a way to be found in him and a way to be found with God. That's what he did. So when we sing that song, the next time we're going to sing that hymn, we're going to sing it with meaning and understanding. Rock of ages, cleft for me, so I can gain access into him. Now, do you know how much effort it takes to create an opening in a rock? Try it. Just take it. Don't even think. Don't even go as far as a rock. When you get home, find a stone. And then begin to whack it with a hammer. And see how much effort it's going to take. In fact, you yourself that is whacking the, the stone, by the time you're done, imagine the pain that you're going to be going through. That is one level of imagination. Now imagine 
if you were the wrong rock that someone is trying to split. Can you imagine if the rock, the physical rock that you are hammering on, if you had a voice to cry out, what, would, what do you think would be saying? Somebody tell me, what would the rock be saying? You are hammering the rock. You are trying to split it. Come on, shout out. What will it be saying? Assuming you are that rock. And someone brings the hammer. Wow. Hitting you. What will you say? What will you say? Is that the way you are going to say it? Help! Stop! I'm here! Some of you are acting, you are acting a different movie. This, oh yeah, let's start this movie again. So you are the rock. And someone takes a hammer. And they are going, guac! Oh yeah, respond. Guac! Respond. What's your response? Please. Eh? Help! Someone takes a hammer. Is this the way you... Ah, may they not use a hammer on you in Jesus' name. What will you do? What will you, what will you do? you scream. Because the pain is too much. We are not talking about spiritual now. I'm talking about physical. Someone takes a physical hammer and they're hammering your head. What will you do? I'm not talking... Listen, listen, listen. Don't do another sermon there. Listen. Someone takes a hammer, they are mark, whacking your head. I'm not talking in the spiritual realm. Physical. What will you do? You will shout. You will scream. Now imagine that was what was being done to Christ. And he allowed himself to be cleft, to be split apart. Why? So you and I can go in. So please, brethren, the next time you think of the Lord Jesus, please, please, appreciate him. Appreciate his goodness. Appreciate his loving kindness. Did, Jesus didn't do it in the spiritual realm. Where did he do it? In the physical realm. Physical body. He didn't do it in the, you know, some people, sometimes you are reading the Bible and you are wondering, okay, Lord, was it real? Is it figuratively? No, Jesus Christ did it literally. It happened to him in person. He was clapped for you and I. So why is there a need for a cleft in the rock? So ask your neighbor, so why did, he, why did he have to pass through that? Ask your neighbor, ask them, why? Why did he have to pass through that? Why? Okay, to create a hiding place for us. We need a hiding place. Who is the first person we need a hiding place from? It will shock you. Exodus 33 21 to 23. Exodus 33, 21 to 23. And the Lord said, he was speaking to Moses, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, while all my glory passeth by, that I will put thee where? In the cleft of a rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back part. But my face thou shalt not be seen. The hymn says, Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. So, he it says, it's a place of shelter and protection. From who? Or from what? The rock protected Moses from God's radiant glory and splendor. The truth of the matter is, you and I need to be hidden in Christ. If you and I face God the way we are, hey, it will just be facing, you know, we will not live to tell the tale of what happened next. Because God's glory and splendor is so pure, is so beautiful. You and I, you cannot stand it. The only way we can approach God is to be inside Christ. And that's why they cleft. That's why Jesus Christ allowed himself to be split apart so we can hide in him. So we can approach God. And that's why when you go to God and pray, you are not praying in the name of Pastor Lola Ezra. In whose name are we praying? In the name of Jesus. Because he's the one that we're hiding in. Do you understand? Do you appreciate what Jesus has done? Hmm. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Shout hallelujah like you mean it. Hallelujah. Psalm 130 verse 3 to 4. Psalm 130 verse 3 to 4. 
He says, if thou, Lord, should mark iniquity, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. When our sins are measured against God's righteousness, we would definitely fall short of his glory. Like Romans 3.23 says, it says, all have sinned and fallen short of his glory. And we deserve death. Like Romans 6.23 says, it says the wages of sin is death. And that was why in the Bible, you will see when people, when they approach God, I think it was the parents of, um, of um, is it Sam's, uh, or Gideon, you know, when they, when they saw the angel and they knew that it was God, the first thing that came, yeah, we are going to die. We have seen God. That was, they were so afraid. We are going to die. We are going to die. And the woman said, we are not dead. We are, we, we've not been dead all this way, so it's okay. God has shown us mercy. But splendor of God, his glory is too pure for you and I to go without Christ. So Jesus allowed himself to be split so we can enter in get our sins forgiven, get our lives cleansed up, and then we can approach the Father via Jesus. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Ah, your thank you is not even big. Thank, thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Colossians 3.3. 3. It says, we are dead, and your life, it says, for you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. It says, you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Aren't we glad that our life is hid in Christ? Our life is hid in Christ and then in God. Wow. Why else? Why else? What else are we, are we, are we hidden from? Or, or who are we hidden from? We are hidden from the enemy's trap. We are hidden from the enemy's trap in Christ Jesus. Psalm 91.3a says, Surely he would deliver us from the snare of the fowler. None of us are a match for the snare of the fowler, if not for Jesus. Because it's only Jesus that enables us to recognize the trap, the snare of the fowler. Only Jesus. The enemy is so smart. He has been dealing with the human race for a long time. He knows how to catch the human race. So it is only God, it's only when we are hidden in Christ that we're able to escape the enemy and his trap. What else are we hidden from? Psalm 91 is a, verse that is a scripture that many of us, even before we became born again, we know it very well. Because it's the believer's uh, uh, battle, battle scripture. Many of us can quote the whole of Psalm 91. We are hidden from trouble. Psalm 91 verse 2 says, I will, tr I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and fortress. My God, in him will I trust. We are hidden in Christ from deadly pestilence. Many of us only survived, in fact, when I say many, all of us only survived the pandemic because we were hidden in Christ. Oh, that's, that's the whole truth. It wasn't because we wore a face mask. Eh? Some of us, we wear the same face, face mask. We wear it for 20 days. <laughs> Some of us buy cloth, cloth face masks. It drops on the floor. We shake it like this and we put. <laughs> In fact, some of us have spoken. We have been gisting, chatting with somebody who has coronavirus. We didn't even know they had it. Only weeks later, we found out that they have coronavirus. And then you're wondering ah, so if we're not eating in Christ, that deadly pestilence would have taken us. So somebody say, thank you, Lord, for hiding thank me in Christ. 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 The terrors of the night. How many of us have had some, night, some nightmares? When you woke up, you actually thought it was real. And it was only when you woke up that you thought, oh my God, this is a dream. But it actually felt real. Now the question is, did it really happen or not? Only God can tell. Maybe while she was sleeping, it was actually happening. Because some of us, we go to bed, we wake up, we are sweating. But we didn't do any exercise overnight. All we did was lay down. So why are you sweating? In winter. In winter. Am I lying? In winter, you, are, you wake up sweating. It's as if 
you have, and you, in the dream, you were fighting and you woke up. So you ask yourself a question, what really happened? You know, one day, in fact, there was once I was almost tempted. I said, I want to have a camera in my room. I want to see my, <laughs> I want to see my physical movement. When I'm, how many people, is it just me? I said, I, I wish I could record this, this thing. I want to see what actually happens when I am sleeping. Am I moving around like this, you know, as if I'm boxing somebody? But it is God that he does from the terror of the night. Yeah. The arrows that fly by day. The arrows, do you know the number of arrows that have been shot, that we missed? Because we are cleft, because Jesus Christ was cleft for us, and we are hidden in him. It says the disease that stalks in darkness. I've always wondered about that. Until last night, God gave me an explanation. How many people have seen headache before? Seen what? You've seen headache. Uh, headache, you've seen it. Eh? What do you do? You just feel it. But is it there? It is there. When you have a headache, your head is pounding you like this. But show me in a book where they have drawn a picture of headache. It is called the disease that stalks in darkness. A lot of diseases talk in darkness, you don't know. It's only under a microscope. They will say, hey, we can see bacteria. And that is the one that allows them to be seen. Many are not seen. I remember 2003, I was ill for three months. They did not find anything. They were just doing tests. Test. After a while, they said, Madam, we don't know what is wrong with you, but we are glad to tell you that you are improving. That was it. Everything they gave me was, uh, go and try this one. Uh, if it works... Praise God. If it doesn't work, come back to us. How many people have been told that before? Because the sickness works in darkness. Nobody can see it. But Jesus Christ is protecting you and nice from such. Ah, come on. Lift up your voice and say, thank you, Lord. He says, God hides us from the disaster that strikes at midday. You will hear people say, ah, but I saw her this morning. But I saw her. They said she just walked. She was just walking down the street. She was just, somebody was sharing with us. Somebody who finished from work, went on a lunch break, sat just to rest, and never came back from that lunch break. Whether it was heat stroke. So there's some challenges that strike people in the midday that God has shielded all of us from. You go out, we walk back home. Some of us even complain, we've had a hard day. We've had a, some people will be glad to have the hard day you have instead of a dead day or a sick day. They will prefer a hard day. But God has been shielding us from the disaster that strikes by midday. The Bible says he shields us from the lion, from the cobra, from the serpent. God has been shielding us from all kinds of things because he has hidden us in the rock. Luke 10, 19 says, Behold, I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. So, why is there a need for a cleft in the rock? To create a hiding place for us. Why is there a need for a cleft in the rock? Jesus Christ. To provide for us living water. Have you ever wondered why God was really angry with Moses? For striking the rock. Instead of speaking to the rock. Because you would not have, is it not just common, ordinary rock? Why? God said, speak to the rock. He struck the rock. In fact, he didn't even strike the rock once. He struck it twice. Why was God angry with Moses? And he almost missed heaven. In fact, he almost missed heaven. The devil was contending with his body. Ah, this man. But God was determined that Moses was going to make it to heaven, even though he didn't get to the promised land. In Numbers 8, 20, sorry, Numbers 20, 8, 10, and 11, God said to Moses, stand before the people. And this time, what you must do is speak to the rock. Moses was angry. You know the story. He smote the rock twice. But if you look at Exodus 17, verse 6, that was the first time this issue of the rock came up again. God said to him, strike the rock. He struck the rock and water came out. The next time, God said, don't strike the rock again, which is our, our, the, text, the first text I read, Numbers 20. In 17, God said, strike the rock, water came out. 
The next time the rock episode came out again, he said, this time around, just speak to the rock. The rock has already been split. This time, you just need to speak. And that's why God said he was angry with Moses for not believing him. Whilst this is not part of my message, please, whatever God tells you to do, do it. Even if it's different from what he told you to do yesterday. Yesterday, he may say to you, strike the rock, water comes out. This time, I may say, you know what, just speak a word. Just speak a word, and it will happen again. Don't say, ah, yesterday you told me to strike. In fact, this time around, I will strike twice. Don't be like that. Do exactly what he tells us to do. Amen. Now, why was God angry? Why was God angry? We are told that the rock was a type of Christ. So when Moses struck the rod the first time, it was like the cleft I was talking about, the piercing of Christ. When he did so the second time, it was as though he was attempting to nail Christ to the cross all over again. And that was why God was angry. So Christ was split for us so that living water can come out. Remember when he met that, met that woman and the woman was asking him, sir, give us water to, I mean, I mean, Jesus said to her, give me water to drink. And then she was, you know, the whole conversation about why he's talking to me, da, 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 happened. And then he said, if only you knew who I was, you would ask me for living water. Huh? If only you knew who I was, you would ask me for living water. That's John 4, 10. John 4, 10. Jesus replied, if only you knew who I am and the gift of God that wants to give you, you would ask me for a drink and I would give you living water. So the rock had to be split so you and I can have access to living water. And 1 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4. 1 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4. He says, and did, all, and did all eat the same spiritual meat? And did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. So the cleft, the splitting was so that you and I can have access to living water. The kind of water we would drink and we would never be thirsty. The kind of water we would drink and we would make it to eternity with Christ. And my prayer is that as the rock has been cleft already, we will have access, not just for a hiding place from all the various things I mentioned, but access to living water amen. in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Say, so believe in amen. amen. Why else was there a need for the rock to be split. Why, why a, cleft, a cleft in the rock? To give us access to his blood. John 19, 33 to 34. John 19, 33 to 34. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. So Jesus was already dead. You have evidence that he's already dead. Why pierce his side? For you and I. Because when they pierced his side, the Bible said water and blood gushed out. So that piercing, that cleft was allowed so you and I can gain access to the blood of Jesus. And the Bible says in 1 John 1, 7, 1 John 1, 7, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, does what? Cleanses us from all sin. So we have this hymn that was written by a person named Augustus M. Topladi. Um, as... Tradition has it, and there are so many theories as to the inspiration for his writing of the hymn. But I picked this one because I feel that this is more plausible than anything else. And we're told that Topladi was traveling along the gorge, and I'll explain to you what a gorge is in a minute, the gorge of Borinton, when he was caught in a storm. And then he found a shelter in a gap in the gorge. He was struck by the title of this hymn, and scribbled down the initial lyrics of this hymn. So what is a gorge? A gorge is a narrow valley between hills or mountain, typically with steep rocky walls 
and a stream flowing through it. So a valley with a stream and on, the, on both sides a rock. So when there's a storm, there are usually gaps in the rock. He went there and hid himself. It was whilst he was there that is him that we're going to rise up and sing now. Um, uh, but before we rise, I'll say a few things um, before we sing it. So the, the summary of this, first, of, the, of this hymn, the first verse says, save and cleanse me. The second verse says, I can't do it on my own. Only Jesus can save. I am fully aware of my insufficiency. The third verse says, I can't even help or offer anything. I bring nothing to the table. And that's why the hymn writer says, we are naked, we are helpless, and we are foul, we are stained. What is the solution? He said, simply to the cross I cling. Wash me, Savior, or I die. Now, do you understand this hymn? Because I think sometimes it's always important to look at the background to every written hymn. So when you're singing it, you're singing it meaningfully. And then verse 4, it says, this will end very badly for me if you don't intercede. I am as guilty as I can be. Let me hide myself in thee. Let's rise up and we're going to take this hymn. And now you're singing this hymn meaningfully and you're singing it differently than the way we have already always sang it. You're singing it knowing fully well what we are talking about. Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let thy water and thy blood. Do you understand now? From thy river side which blows be your sin. The Father, thank you, Lord. 
thank you, Lord. Rock of ages, rock of ages, my rock, my shelter, my eternal refuge. Thank you, Lord. 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 Lift up your voice and say, Father, hide me in the cleft of the rock. Hide my children. Hide my family. Hide us as a church. Hide us as a nation in the cleft of the rock, the rock which is Christ. Hide us from the enemy's trap. Hide us from trouble. Hide us from deadly pestilence. Hide us from the terrors of the night. Hide us from the arrows that fly in the day. Hide us from the disease that stalks in darkness. Hide us from the disaster that strikes at noonday. Hide us, O oh God, from the lions out there, the cobras, the serpents, O oh God. You say you've given unto us power. Empower us, O oh God. Help us to walk in power. Nothing shall by enemies hurt us in the name of Jesus. Say, Father God, the rock was also split, so I have access to living water. Say, Father, fill me with your living water. Fill me with your living water. Fill me with your living water. Fill me. Jesus said to that woman, if only you know the person who is asking you for water, you would ask him for living water. Say, Father, I need living water. Fill me with your living water. Let your living water flood my soul. Let your living water flood my soul. We sing that song. Let your living water flow over my soul. Let your Holy Spirit come and take control of every situation that has troubled my mind. All my cares and burdens unto you I roll. Let's up your burdens to him now and say, let your living water flow over my soul. There's a refreshing that comes with the living water. There's a refreshing that comes. There's a cleansing that comes with the blood of Jesus. Lift up your voice. Say thank you, Lord, for being the cleft in the rock. The rock cleft for me. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Grant me access to living water. Refresh my soul. Refresh my soul. Cleanse my life. Purge my life with your blood. The Bible says they pierced his side, even though he was dead already. Say, Lord, grant me access to your blood. Wash me in the blood of Jesus. Wash me in the blood of Jesus. Cleanse me. Heal me. Deliver me, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Don't let your shed blood be in vain. Don't let your shed blood be in vain. In the name of Jesus, living water flow afresh over my soul. Begin to lift up your burdens to the Lord and say, Father, let your living water flow over every burden in my life. Let your living water flow over every challenging situation. Let your living water flow. Let your living water flow. He said to this woman, I know you have so many troubles. I know you have so many issues, but all you need is the living water. Say, Father, let your living water flow over my soul. Let it flow over my body. Let it flow over my spirit. Let it flow over my whole let it flow over our world. Let's begin to pray the living water of God upon our nations of the world. There's so much unrest in the nations of the world. We hear about what's happening in Israel, in Gaza, in all these places. Lord Jehovah God, we are praying, oh God, we are praying, let your living water begin to flow. Let your living water begin to flow over our world, over our nation, over our lives. Let your living water flow. Let your living water flow. Let it be to give us peace, oh God. In the name of Jesus, peace, oh God. In our body, in our soul, in our spirit, Lord, let your living water flow, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Let your living water flow. Let there be a change. Let there be a turnaround, God. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Lift up your two hands to the Lord. Father, we thank you. Because today you have given us a revelation of this song, this timeless song that we have sung for years and years. Now we have a clearer understanding of it. Thank you for what you have done. Thank you for even giving us that vivid picture of, of, of how painful it must have been, you know, for, for, for you to go through the whole process of being cleft for us. Thank you, Lord, for going through that process for us. Thank you for giving us a hiding place in you, 
giving up. Thank you, Lord, for allowing your blood to be shed. Thank you, Lord, for living water that you are to us. We bless your name. We pray that our lives will not remain the same. We pray that as we go out there, you will use us as change agents in our world because of the knowledge we now have in the name of Jesus. Thank you, everlasting Father. And every need that has been presented before you. Is it spiritual? Is it financial? Is it marital? Is it economical? Is it academic? Father God, whatever the challenge, whatever the nature of it may be, living water flow over it. And let there be solutions in the name of Jesus. Living water flow over it. And let there be solutions. This woman went back. She was so excited. She said, I met a man who tells me everything, I, everything about myself. She was so excited. Can you imagine? That woman would not be the same again. Father, we have heard the truth today. You said the truth we know will make us free. We are made free by virtue of this truth that we have learned today. And so we are going out with authority, with boldness, knowing who we are and whose we are in Christ. Thank you, everlasting Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. Ah, your hallelujah is sitting on one leg. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.